Hi everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Accessibility and Design. Well, we're happy to have you here today. You might be wondering who we are. My name is Courtney Clark. I'm the Vice President of Design at Forum One. Um, and I lead a team of, what is it, 12 I think now? Very talented designers who specialize in visual design, user experience, illustration, video, you name it, we do it. <laughs> but also accessibility, which leads me to Kim. Hi everyone, I am Kim Lowcraft. I'm a design director at Forum One. I am a learner and advocate um, of accessibility, so I am excited to be here to talk to you today and kind of share a little bit about what I've learned. Awesome. And at Forum One, we were a uh, an agency that's been around for 23 years. We've worked with thousands of nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, um, and it's not just designers. We also have some very talented developers who are in the audience, and you probably have met some of them around the conference today. Um, but we do a little bit of everything, with our main goal being to create an impact, help our clients create an impact. And this is a quick peek at who some of our clients are. You'll notice a range of government agencies, foundations, nonprofits. We are so pleased to be able to partner with these groups and many more. Um, and if you're a client out there, come say hello after. But this isn't about Forum One. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? So first, I'd love to get a sense of who's in the audience. That'll help us customize what we talk about and where we focus. So, please raise your hand if you are a developer. Yeah, awesome, welcome. How many of you consider yourselves designers? Hey, designers. Awesome, any project managers in the audience? Yes, keep us on time, <laughs> on budget, come on in. Um, what about, who am I missing, content creators? Yeah, oh, so important. Without content, what do we have? Um, what else? And who are we missing? Yeah, who else is out there who hasn't raised their hand yet? What do you, what do, you do? Did I get everybody? <laughs> Somebody's We've just got afraid one, to shout one it out. One in the back. <laughs> like I'm just here. <laughs> just a fan of accessibility. Awesome. Great, well thank you, that's very helpful. We have a very lovely mix of folks today. So, to start us off, Kim. You may have noticed a slight underwater theme in the photos that you've seen so far, and that's because I am a big scuba diver. I find that diving often has these important life lessons, and accessibility is no exception. So I thought um, I could start by sharing a story with you all, a diving story, that I think will really put us in the right uh, frame of mind for today's discussion. Years ago, I um, had the honor of going diving with this woman who was paralyzed from the waist down. When she first wanted to learn how to dive, she was told that there were simply too many barriers and that it might not be the right sport for her. But it turns out all of these people were wrong with just a little bit of adjustment to how we set up the dive, she was able to fully participate. And she told me that the reason she loves diving so much is because under the water, we're all equal, we're all weightless, and we can all fly. And I really appreciated that perspective. And from that moment on, it completely changed how I saw diving. I no longer just went swimming, I no longer just went diving, but I could fly. And so today, we're going to transition into accessibility and what that means so that you can help your audiences fly online, metaphorically. Yeah. <laughs> so what, how would you describe digital accessibility? Let's get our definitions together first. Yeah, so accessibility has kind of been this evolving term. Uh, what started out as something that was in a physical space has become bigger. Um, so when we're talking about digital accessibility, we're specifically saying that everyone, including those with disabilities, um, has equal access to be able to use digital products and services equally. Now the thing is, accessibility as a term uh, is often associated with a lot of rules, 
and laws and even lawsuits. But at the end of the day, it's really just about people. And it's about removing barriers. It's about um, equal access. It's about inclusion. And it's about creative problem solving and innovation. But we recognize at the same time that there's still a lot to learn. And so that's why we wanted to share five tips with you all that we've really learned along our path uh, to, to learning that really helped shape our understanding of and approach to accessibility. So we're hoping that it does the same for you. We're gonna sprinkle in a few case studies to provide some real uh, examples for you. And we're doing this with one goal, and that's to present accessibility not as something that you should be doing, but really as something that you want to be doing and giving you access to the resources to make it easier to do. Resources, so this deck is available online already. If you follow Form 1 or you find me on LinkedIn, I've already shared the, um, the link to it. So it's accessible and you can get to it now. All right, All right. let's get started. So tip number one is to design for the ed edges. And the summary is, if you design for the average person, um, you're actually not reaching as many people as you think you are. If we can design for the edges, much more likely to reach more people. So let me tell you a little story. And this is a story actually originally told by Todd Rose. He has a TED Talk where he shares this story. And I thought it was so great that I wanted to share it as well. So in the 1950s, um, the Air Force had the best technology they'd ever had. They had an amazing set of pilots, um, but they were having the worst outcomes that they'd had in a long time. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. They tried more training, they tried many things, but they, they started to do an investigation to dig in a little bit. I'm not a pilot myself, but as you can imagine, in a cockpit, there are many controls, uh, many screens, um, and it's life or death. <laughs> if you hit something wrong, you're in big trouble. So in their investigation, they discovered that the problem was not the pilots, it was actually the design of the cockpit. The cockpits had been designed for an average shape and sized pilot. Um, and as you can imagine, what that meant was it was hard to adjust if you didn't fit that average. So they decided uh, to actually test this theory out and they chose 10 dimensions and they measured all their pilots to see where they fit along those dimensions. And as you can see here is a pretty jagged profile and there wasn't a single person who fit down the middle in that average. So their whole plan of designing for the average, thinking it was reaching everyone, actually reached no one. So they took a very bold stance, and they said to the groups that they worked with, we're no longer designing for the average, we are designing for the edges. And what that meant was when they began to design for the edges, they had to create adjustments, but what that allowed them to do was, one, the pilots that they currently have started performing better because they could adjust where they needed to be and, and what they could see within the cockpit. It also meant that they were able to diversify their talent pool, um, and it continues to diversify today. So, within the Air Force, when they took this opportunity to design for the edges, improve performance, wider audience, wider opportunities for pilots. Similar thing in digital. When you design for those edges, you are improving the performance of the people who are already coming and using your tools and websites and apps and resources. But in addition to that, you're also expanding your audience reach. I don't know if you've been reading the news lately, but Domino's has been in the news for a while. They're being sued because if you are a blind person using a screen reader, anybody re using a screen reader, you're not able to complete an order. And so Domino's is being sued for that. Um, and uh, I forget who the person was that they interviewed. Um, I think it was like the American Association for the Blind. But the guy was like, take our money. <laughs> like, just fix this and we'll order pizza. <laughs> Be, get innovative, innovative there. So it's about expanding audience reach. 
Okay, so we're not pilots, and you're probably not designing cockpits, so translate this for us. Right. What does this mean for digital accessibility? Exactly. We'll probably all never sit in a cockpit, cockpit of a jet, but um, we all experience digital products and services every day, whether it's just in our personal lives or from the hands I saw earlier. It's part of what we do every day for a living. So I want you all to think about whatever project you're working on right now, whatever problem you're trying to solve, and think about the audience that you're trying to solve that for. Now we're going to start to map that audience. And we don't even have to pick the 10 dimensions. Um, we can start with four, and specifically the four categories uh, that really um, affect how people use and experience digital services. And those four categories are vision, hearing, kind of physical or mobility, and cognitive. So we have our categories, but we really need to understand how that affects experience in the digital space. So if we just look a little bit deeper, we have vision, which affects how people read text, view images, really our ability to use our eyes for understanding to make, uh, and to make connections, and examples of things that might affect our ability to see is perhaps you have a permanent disability, such as um, no vision or low vision. Perhaps you have some type of um, color blindness, but you could also have a temporary disability or a situational disability, such as sensitivity to light or movement. Um, you could be in a bright space that affects how you can see or a dark space. One thing about vision that people forget too is as we age, our vision gets worse. So if you think about your audiences as an aging population as well, this becomes really important too. For hearing, obviously it affects how people can hear dialogue and video and any type of audio cues. And examples, um, perhaps you're deaf or low hearing. You might have ringing in your ears, um, either something permanent or perhaps you were at a loud or, um, concert the night before. Uh, you could be just in a noisy space. All of that affects your ability to, to hear. Or you're at a conference and you're scrolling through Facebook and you don't want to turn on the volume so you're reading the captions. Guilty? Anybody? <laughs> no, you're all very attentive. <laughs> Next with physical or motor really affects how people find, navigate through, and interact with content. So think about this, is, is my audience using a keyboard to complete tasks? Are they using a mouse, perhaps a touch screen? And examples of how someone might choose to interact with uh, your website, they could be missing a limb, perhaps they have hand tremors, a broken arm, could be holding a baby, um, or perhaps in cases that experience all the time, a colleague borrows your mouse, mm -hmm. and now you're left with just your keyboard as the option. Cognitive really affects things like memory and problem solving, our ability to pay attention and to understand what uh, we're seeing and hearing. Things that affect this could be dyslexia, attention deficit disorder, tiredness, nervousness, stress. All of these things really impact our ability to complete tasks and understand what we're looking at. So we have our categories, now we just have to define those edges. And for the sake of this example, we're keeping with the low, average, and high to think about our edge cases. Um, but really, these can be as broad or as specific as you need them to be, depending on the problem that you are working on at the time. So let's start mapping that audience. And just start by picking one person within that audience. This is Jane. She considers herself to be pretty average. But Jane sometimes needs glasses, and that affects her ability to see. So that impacts her vision. Jane also happens to be working at a very noisy coffee shop, trying to watch a video, but she forgot her headphones. So her hearing um, has been uh, impacted pretty heavily. Jane is using a mouse, but when she gets nervous or stressed or anxious, she starts to shake. And that makes it harder for her to hit those targets, so smaller buttons, perhaps radio buttons, it's harder for her to get those. And why is she stressed? Because she's trying to buy tickets to her favorite concert, 
to see her favorite band, and it keeps timing her out. That's causing a lot of anxiety for her. So you can see that even if this unicorn of an average existed, if that person was out there, there are all of these experiences that could affect um, their ability to complete tasks, whether it's a permanent disability, a temporary one, or a situational one. And this is all just one person. I know you all, thinking of your target audience, are thinking of all of the people. That's a lot of scenarios. That's a lot of situations. How do you solve for all of those issues? And that's where we say, design to the edges. If you are finding a solution that works for your high end and your low end, you are not only capturing the people on both ends, but you are better problem solving for everybody in between. So that's why our takeaway today is wherever you are in your process, think about your edges and then start designing to them. All right. Tip number two, focus on the people first, then learn the rules. Um, we know that there are many acronyms out there, ADA, AA, WCAG, and all the numbers that go along with them. And it can be a, kind of overwhelming if you're new to it or trying to understand exactly what they mean. Our advice here is to start by understanding the people in this scenario. It relates nicely to our first tip. And uh, WC3 has already put out an excellent video uh, to show what this looks like and what this means. So let me adjust the volume real quick because I had on some bossa nova earlier. <laughs> Do you want it up? Or lower, a little bit lower. And we'll adjust if it's too loud. Okay. We'll watch a little bit here. Abilities, perspectives, video captions. Video isn't just about pictures, it's also about sound. Without the audio, you'd have to guess what this film is about. Frustrating, isn't it? Not knowing what's going on. That's the situation for everyone who can't hear. Captions make videos accessible. Which is also handy for people who want to watch video in loud environments. Or when you need to be very, very quiet. Colors with good contrast. There's something about great design that allows it to go practically unnoticed. But it doesn't take much to make things confusing and frustrating. Choosing colors with poor contrast makes navigating, reading, and interacting a real pain. This design needs sufficient contrast between foreground and background colors. That's not just text and images, but links, icons, and buttons. If it's important enough to be seen, then it needs to be clear. And this is essential for people with low contrast sensitivity, which becomes more common as we age. With good colors, websites and applications can be easier to use in more situations, like in different lighting conditions. Voice recognition. Imagine that you could only communicate with your family by writing. Sometimes it's just easier to speak. One of the advances of technology is voice recognition, whether it's searching the web, nineteenth century architecture, dictating emails, or controlling your navigation. Many people with physical disabilities rely on voice recognition to use the computer. order. But for that to happen, websites and apps need to be properly coded. Go. Cancel. Voice recognition can help lots of other people with temporary limitations too, like an injured arm. It can also prevent injuries becoming worse, like RSI, repetitive stress injury, all for people simply preferring voice. Some people can see the text on the screen. Fortunately, computers can convert text to speech. It's technology that many people who are blind have been relying on for years. But it's also important for many people with dyslexia and very useful for people with difficulty reading text. As well as some people who just like to multitask. But for this to work, Websites and apps have to be properly coded, which has the added benefit of helping search engines index websites' contents better. Oh. 
Display layout and design. So there are, there are about eight or nine of these, I think, um, and the link is in the deck as well, um, that have great examples showing people using um, different technologies and the scenarios where they might need them. Uh, they've done a really great job. I would encourage you to share these with your colleagues when you're talking about accessibility. Um, uh, share them online. This is a great way for people to actually see what it means because sometimes we talk a lot about it. I've found that it doesn't really resonate with people until they see it either via video or watch somebody actually use a screen reader or use, it, use a variety of technologies. And then it sort of sinks in. It's like, oh, that's what's happening? Yeah. That's actually a really good point because when I was first learning about accessibility, it was presented to me as just a checklist and I was trying to go through and check everything off the list, but then I was able to hear my design through a screen reader and all of a sudden everything clicked. I was like, I understand. When you understand kind of what the problems are and how people use things, you can better plan and solve for it. All right. So the next step is to bake it into your existing process. Do you want to talk us through this one? Yeah. So really the point of this is don't think about accessibility as something additional that you need to do. Really think about it um, as baking it into a process that you're already doing. And doing this is going to save you time and it's going to save everybody money. And the reason for that is um, is accessibility best practices kind of build on themselves so the decisions you make early on will affect the accessibility of the final product. And if you plan for and prepare in advance, uh, you're going to avoid costly rework later. So let's look at an example. You have some stories to tell. <laughs> so um, there was a group, uh, we will call them the Pacific Whale Conservancy. This is a fake group. <laughs> that we're protecting the names of the people involved. Uh, they had just launched a beautiful new website and it was on time. They were really excited about it. Their main goal is to get donations. Um, so they were very pleased. A couple months after launch, they got some feedback. So this is not a real organization, but this is a real story of what happened. <laughs> Uh, and somebody was using a screen reader and trying to move through the donation process and was failing um, and sent an email to the organization and was like, hey, what do I do? I'm trying to donate here. So this group, very frustrated, came to Forum 1 and was like, we don't know what to do. We thought it was great. We launched. Uh, it looked beautiful. What now? So... Like on most sites, we started with an audit. Do you want to say a little bit about the audit? Yeah, so if ever you are curious about what your current state of accessibility is, if ever you want to improve your accessibility um, and you want to know what you should do, always start with an audit. That's going to kind of give you a real idea of the landscape of where you are so you know what you need to do. We're happy to talk to you more about audits. We don't have time to go into what it looks like and how to do it today. Uh, that's a whole other talk that we'd love to give. Um, but here's a couple of examples of the results and what we were checking in on. And once we did the audit, then we started to fix those things after launch. And the outcome of that is that even though the issues were fixed, it was three additional months before they were fixed. It took time to figure out what the problem was and then how to resolve it. And so what that meant is for the overall project timeline, it actually wasn't on time because there was rework that needed to be done. And as you can imagine, that work costs time and money. Um, so not the most efficient way to do this. But there is a more efficient way. So our advice is to, as Kim said, bake accessibility into the work that you're already doing. Let's see what, what difference that example. makes. So, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, so Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security came to us uh, to build a website, and they had some very strict accessibility guidelines that they wanted to follow. So we started off the project already knowing what our goal was. Um, the team was able to approach the entire project, working accessibility best practices into the, the UX, the design, 
the build, the content, all aspects of it. Um, then, right as they were getting ready to launch, they found out that they actually had some additional guidelines that they needed to reach. And they were really, really worried that this was going to cause a delay in their launch. It was going to cost uh, more money. But when they ran a test, uh, they discovered that the website not only passed, but exceeded um, their expectations. And they told us that this was the first site that passed the strictest accessibility standards at Georgetown. So what went from a situation where they thought they were going to have to spend more time and money in order to actually launch their website, it turned out that because of the best practices that were built in along the way, we had already hit all of the official guidelines that make something compliant, but we also went beyond that making the website actually accessible, meaning that it was easy for audiences to use. So they were quite pleased. Yeah, and at Forum One, as I mentioned, about half of our work is government work. So we've been in this space for a while where you're required to meet these requirements. So, so the good news was that our team was already well versed in the, in the rules um, and a lot of the tools that we were using and the themes that we were using had baked a lot of this in as well, which helped us along the way. So the key takeaway is remember accessibility doesn't just happen, it takes intention, it takes a team, and when you bake it into your process, uh, you're going to have a much easier time and you're going to have better outcomes. And that leads to the next step. Accessibility is a team sport. Uh, it requires everyone to get involved. So. Who do you think is primarily responsible for accessibility? Shout it out. Content creators. Content creators? Ooh, I like that. Everyone. Everyone. I haven't heard content creators. That's good, though. I do. That's a good one. The most common answer I get is developers. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It's a bad answer. And we're here to say it's not just developers. Sure, you all have a role to play, but it's also designers, it's the project managers, it's the content creators for sure, it's also the product owners who are leading the project and approving things along the way. So take a screenshot of this slide and share it with your whole team and then you can be like, it's everybody's responsibility, not just mine. So in the end, you're responsible and you can be that advocate on your team and we also have some tips of, for each of these roles about what they should be doing and what their role is around accessibility. And this is my invitation, let's all skate. Uh, if this is new to you, it may feel like you're walking upstairs in rollerblades, but rest assured it gets easier with time and we have some guidance and are happy to chat with you more about um, what to do depending on your role. So, it's one thing we tell you to bake accessibility into your process. We're telling you that it's everybody's job, but you're probably sitting there saying, okay, well how? Give me the how. Uh, so we've been working on a comprehensive list by role to kind of help give you guidance. We obviously don't have time to go into all of the, the things. So we asked our team leads um, in each department what would be the top three things that you would want to share to really get somebody started. And the first for developers is really think about your role as building the thing so that people on the edges have options. There's flexibility. And you can do this by using semantic markup. So this is HTML5, and you're probably hearing a lot about ARIA. Perhaps you have questions. I very much encourage you to go to YouTube and look up Alleycasts with Rob Dotson. And that's A11Y, in case you are curious. Um, he offers a whole bunch of really short tutorials that are really helpful for developers and for anybody who's curious to learn more about what developers do. So definitely check those out. The next thing is you're going to want to test and test often, but you want to make sure to use both automated and manual tests for your tools. Um, in the presentation deck, you'll be able to link to some of um, the developer's favorite tools that we use. And we say you need to use both because you remember a machine can't test for everything. They can't, uh, it can't figure out intention. 
um, and it doesn't understand how people are actually using technology. And so that's why you also want to do manual testing along the way and what that might look like. Uh, it's really helpful to learn a little bit about screen readers um, to be able to use that to kind of hear your designs, kind of really see if what you have created um, ended up working out as you intended. Um, you can use VoiceOver for Mac if you're a, a Mac user, that's free. And NVDA is also free if you're a Windows user. The next thing is tell your team what you need. So because we always hear that it's a developer's job and we could hear all of you developers groan, obviously there's things that you do and you're like, well, what if I inherit a bad design or poor decisions that came early on? A lot of accessibility knowledge has historically lived with you all. So you should feel free, talk to your team, let them know about what you do and what you need, and they can help you with things, easy things like alt text, defining the reading or tab order. These are things that you might be responsible for making it possible to add alt text, but you shouldn't be responsible for coming up with what that alt text is. You have a team, they're there to help. Kim, who should write the alt text? Oh, well, we will get there. Oh, oh, good. Don't you jump ahead. <laughs> so for our user experience designers, design for all users, including those on the edges. For you all, really adopt an inclusive design approach and learn about the ranges of disability and how they um, affect the way an audience might interact uh, with your website with that user journey. And this is where if you are on a design team or a designer yourself, those videos are really helpful. It's a good intro for your team to start talking about this, getting a screen reader, starting to use it as Kim said. There's a lot of learning that still needs to happen in the user experience field around accessibility. So learn is tip number one. Yep, exactly. And then something that you can actually do, uh, include di a diverse set of people in your research, the personas that you're writing, um, your user stories, and be an advocate whenever you can. Include people with disabilities in your usability tests. How many of you are currently doing that right now? Anybody? Yay! Yes. Nice work. Three people in the back. That's who you ask. I love it. And the next thing, document order on complex layouts and wireframes. So you might have just previously heard me talk about reading order or tab order. It's important to know that a lot of people who use assistive technology or who can't see, that technology cannot interpret the correct way to move through a page. So that has to be <coughs> programmed in and told. Um, oftentimes, it ends up in the developer's lap to make that decision. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but other times in more complex layouts, it might not be. So as a UX designer, you're in the best position to know the intended order for the experience, and you can document that in your wireframes, um, designers in your mockups, so that that information is clearly communicated to your developers. And of course, review with your developers, because we know that how they might build it may affect the reading order, so you should really be working together on this. Yep. For our UX designers, if you want just some quick tips to learn more, um, we're linking you to these posters that you can print out and read. Um, the link is in here. It's inclusivedesignprinciples.org, so you'll have those available to you. And these are great to hang in your office. It gets people talking about it, stopping by and reading. Um, we've given a similar presentation and recommended posters. and. When people start to do that, they start to like learn themselves. So, good tip there. All right, our visual designers. Do what you want to do anyway. Create clear and clean solutions. Um, you, like uh, UX designers, should be learning about the range of disabilities. Again, because when you understand how people approach things, how people use things, when you understand a problem, you can better solve for it in advance. So learning is always the first step. Um, and only present options that are accessible. Really make a commitment um, to accessibility 
And you can be baking that into a lot of your decisions around color contrast, whether it's text on background or text on images, a lot of your layout decisions, making sure that they're clear and easy to understand. You can be doing that anyway. Um, so make that commitment and just work it into your process. And the next thing is get creative. So I wanted to put this in here because of a lot of visual designers hear accessibility and they think it's gonna limit their creativity and it's in fact just the opposite. You should be creative, you should be trying to do new things. You know, you're trying to solve for problems in lots of different ways. So we say, stay creative, try new things, but make a plan. And that means really talk to the rest of your team, especially your developers. Sometimes you come up with an idea or a solution and the correct way to build it or the most accessible way to build it isn't always obvious and isn't always an easy like black or white decision. So you, the more time you give in advance to communicate, come up with a plan, you give your developers time to like practice and try things out, the better the outcome will be. This is a big shift in thinking too for a lot of visual designers where that second bullet point only present options that are accessible. The first time you do that, it's going to be really hard, but it gets easier with time because you're starting to think like, if somebody can't see this, how are they consuming it? What are our alternative ways? Um, so big challenge, important challenge. And for our visual designers interested in learning more about design's contribution to accessibility, we're linking you to these fun posters, um, which really serve as a, a great reminder of things that you can consider um, every day. Again, print these out, hang these up. They spark some really interesting conversations. Mm -hmm. Our content creators. <laughs> so ensure your content is easier for everyone to read. I can't overstate how important content is for accessibility it's so incredibly important. Um, it's kind of the basis of everything we do. So really put a focus on writing content that is simplified so that everybody can understand it. Now I've put write alt text for your images in this section because oftentimes it will come down to the content creator or the, the editor who's uploading the photo. Um, make sure you're using alt text. And for anyone who alt text might be new, it's basically a text description of an image uh, that communicates the intent and purpose of that image so that anyone who might not be able to see it, whether they're using a, a screen reader or a low bandwidth area, will still understand the purpose and intention behind that image. In a perfect world, whoever has chosen the image should be responsible for that alt text because you chose it, you know the intention. So keep that in mind if you're recommending you know, icons that are communicating something important, if you're creating some type of graphic or uploading an image um, even to present a particular type of emotion, include alt text along with that. Also gonna wanna write at a fifth or sixth grade level. This is really gonna help you simplify your content, uh, making it easier for everybody to read. And there's this uh, online tool, the Hemingway Editor, and that's an easy place for you to copy and paste your content right in uh, and see kind of where you stand in the readability level. Has anybody used the Hemingway Editor? Yeah, it's one of my favorites because not only will it tell you the grade level, it'll also identify if you're using passive voice or active voice. Mm -hmm. It'll also say like if how long your sentences are and if they're too long. Um, so it gives even more advice beyond the grade level. And we say fifth or sixth grade level because um, there have been previous agencies or eight government agencies who've recommended a, around that level. Kim, you had a really interesting anecdote about even if people are college educated, they read at a different level. Yeah, you read at about five to six years below your maximum education level. And I thought that was interesting. I never even thought about it that way. Okay. And if you are writing more simply, again, you're just broadening your audience who can understand what you're talking about. And then make sure you are writing uh, clear, informative headlines. Well, make sure you're using headlines <laughs> and then making sure that they're clear. And this is going to help everybody kind of quickly skim through your pages, find that information that's most important to them. But it's also really important if you're using assistive technologies that can't kind of make spatial relationships. 
Um, screen readers, for example, can use, can navigate from headline to headline, and the clearer the information in your headline is, the more you use headlines to break up your content, the easier it is for people to find the information that they're looking for. This sounds really simple, but I will tell you, when we have done audits or when we've worked with clients or groups on doing this stuff, it can be a real challenge because it, often it's a different way of working for them. Um, and they're used to writing maybe like long research papers where they don't need clear headlines and it's fine to use all the jargon. Um, or they're definitely not writing at a fifth or sixth grade level in their usual everyday activities um, as a subject matter expert. So it's definitely a shift, um, but this easy stuff gets you very far along. For our project managers in the audience, we said that accessibility is uh, a team sport, which means you are the team captain. So you're in a really good position to make sure that accessibility is happening at every phase of your project. And there's things that you can do to help ensure that that's happening. And that's first start out by addressing accessibility at the beginning of your project, at a kickoff. That's gonna make sure that you confirm all the details and set expectations across the team. You're also going to make sure that you include accessibility as a product requirement and your acceptance criteria. This again is going to make sure that it's happening at each phase. And then bring in an accessibility expert if there's gaps in your team's knowledge. And don't be surprised if you do find there's people on your team that aren't really sure what this means. And that's because accessibility is kind of this evolving thing and historically it's not been a formal part of education. So people are really learning on the job, they're learning as they go, and that means that their experience is going to range significantly. So always check in with your team, see if they need help, and then help get them uh, resources. That one's really key too, because just as a, like a contractor or a partner with government agencies, we often see the accessibility requirements in the request for proposal, or we hear about it from the, the team lead, but it, what can also happen is that they're not really sure what that means, they're not really sure what that looks like, they're not really sure how to execute on it, and that's where we're very happy to help, but there's, it, it works better when the whole team is learning at the same time as well. And our product owners or client. So really, just be sure you're making accessibility a priority on all of your projects, especially those ones that you know are coming up or in the pipeline. Um, you can just very clearly state your commitment to accessibility or for your government folks, you have uh, your standards. So put those standards, put your expectation in your request for proposal. And then ask vendors about their experience and about their approach. And then be sure to add accessibility testing to your quality assurance plan. Again, testing is really important throughout, so you want to make sure that you're, you're planning for that before a project even starts. And then, if you feel like maybe this is a little bit overwhelming or you could use some help, identify a champion on your team. That person can really help make sure you're asking the right questions, providing support, be serving as a backup. Number two is a big one too because you're likely working with a number of vendors or partners and this is the hard question you should always, always be asking over and over again. Um, it'll be interesting what answers you get. Um, we're getting asked this question a little bit more often, probably not as often as people are, should be asking us. All right, got a couple tips along the way. Um, we're almost out of time so I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. but. The thing you should also know about accessibility is it is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Unfortunately, it's just never done. Um, so our advice here is to aim for better, not perfect. And I have a quick story about an organization who did just that. This is Julia Stash, she's a former president of uh, the MacArthur Foundation. They just got a new president. Um, and when she came into the foundation, she streamlined grant making, um, but another thing she did was she refocused on their tagline. If you listen to NPR, you've probably heard it a thousand times, um, but their tagline is, is quite lovely, committed to, to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. And so they took this lens 
through their tagline and looked at everything they were doing from their grant making to their tech team and their communications team. And when those groups looked at that, they said, are we creating materials and experiences that are just? Well, if they're not accessible, they're not just. And so that encouraged them to focus on accessibility. And this started in 2016. So these were the steps that they went through. And I will tell you, spoiler, they're still working on it today. And we've partnered with them along the way. So first, they made that commitment. They said, we're going to meet WCAG 2.0 AA. They did an independent developer scan. Um, and some of their um, pages and their design system, they took a second look at. The next year, they worked with WebAIM to do a more thorough scan and report of the site. And they also started the redesign process of the entire site. It was phased. But here's a quick peek at what the actual accessibility review looked like. You'll notice that there's tables of guidance. They also have screenshots of the different pieces and what was working and what wasn't, and notes along the way. And this was really helpful because they actually handed us the WebAIM scan. And so we had that going into the redesign to know, here are the existing problems that we need to fix in the next round. Finally, they started looking more deeply at content and optimizing that. And I will tell you, there was a space to write alt text, but guess how many times people had actually put in alt text? Not that many. And it was a big, it was a big undertaking given the number of images on the site. Um, so they spent a significant amount of time doing that along with other things related to content. Um, and it was a phased redesign, and it says complete question mark because, again, like, are you ever really done? There's always more work to do. And then finally, again, some more testing, usability testing. Um, and they're also working on a grantee booklet around web accessibility. So they give probably hundreds, if not thousands, of grants away every year. And so their grantees now have some guidance and things to learn around accessibility. And they'll do a follow-up scan as well. So our advice here is to just get started. Ask the question. It's one step in front of another. And as you can see from the MacArthur Foundation and many other organizations that we've worked with, um, it's, it's a process. It's a marathon. It's going to take some time. And you and your team are going to learn some things along the way. Yeah. And so really, at the end of the day, just remember that we're all trying to remove barriers and make um, our products and services more usable for all people. And when you do that, because everyone in, the, um, in this room has the power to remove barriers, when you do, you never know what else you might gain. Like me with diving, you might even learn to fly. So oh. you never know. Thanks. We'd love to hear your questions. We will either answer or try and find the answer for you. Um, I also would be really happy to send you the deck directly. If you have a card, we can exchange cards and I can send it to you. It's also posted online. Um, so yeah, what questions do you have for us? Yes. A-N-D-I. Oh, that's a great tip. So if you couldn't hear, the Social Security Administration has a tool called ANDI, um, and it's great for non-developers, she's a designer, um, to scan the page, and you can see how the screen reader would go through. I haven't used it, have you? I haven't. And that's the thing, there's so many tools out there, and each one has its own benefit. And so when you find something that works, always, always share it, because it's going to help somebody else. 
So yeah, we, we'll please put it keep in sharing. Our presentation. Thank you. Other questions or tools or tips from you all? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, often when I sit in on, on accessibility things, there's a lot of emphasis on the public facing side of the website, mm -hmm. but all of these things should also be for back end development as well because the idea is to remove barriers on both sides, particularly yep. within government websites. You know, you, we don't want to build an environment where you, you can't have uh, accessibility for jobs within the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really happy that you brought that up because that's one of the biggest uh, misconceptions or misunderstandings is that accessibility only applies to your audience, but your audience includes your employees, your staff, people actually doing the work. Um, so make sure that all of the best practices you're doing are also applicable to those uh, employees and internal as well. That's a great point. And that's, like you mentioned, internal job sites, intranets, any tool you're using that's not accessible to the public but that your team is using mm -hmm. internally. Yeah. Yep. And, and really, honestly, anything that is that is generated to go into the federal government. So yep. if mm -hmm. there is a call for proposals, the proposal mm -hmm. should go back in, able to be worked with in an accessible format. Yep. Right. Because that's part of the requirement. Yep. Absolutely. We should talk. It sounds like we have a lot in common. <laughs> Yes. Uh, just a quick question. So if your audience, in fact, is an academic organization, mm -hmm. that is your audience, mm -hmm. um, will not putting down fifth and sixth grade education readability standards, will that affect that WCAG ranking of that website? So when you get into the details of content, um, a lot of the recommendations that are in there are actually kind of beyond the, the standard for like WCAG 2.0 AA. You get more into 2.1 or AAA um, or even beyond. So it's incorporating more just best practices for a more general audience. So it won't necessarily trigger a fail point, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the content you put up there is usable and accessible by the people who are reading it. Yeah, and our advice would be for an academic audi audience or like a very specific niche audience mm -hmm. is you're still going to have some broad information on your homepage or like a form they need to fill out or things like that. Mm -hmm. Those are great places to do the fifth and sixth grade reading level. When you have that in-depth research report or whatever it is, fine, go deeper, use the correct language and jargon and, and acronyms as, well, as long as they're defined. But there's sort of like a funnel that you should be looking at around usage. And also what's the activity they're trying to complete? If it's something more generic, like signing up for your email newsletter or a form or something like that, keep it really simple. Can I restate the question? Sure. So the question is um, when you have more complicated images that aren't like happy boy in a park, scientific images that are more complex, recommendations around alt text. Yeah. So I see people approach this in one of two ways. Um, one is to explain the image right there in the, the content mm -hmm. section. But another way you can do it is add alt text um, that is as succinct as possible, but if it's really complex, you can then link people uh, to more information. So there's the two ways I've seen people approach that. Other questions? Yes. How do you handle large scale, uh, I guess, accessibility projects? How do you guys break it down? What's your approach on prioritizing what to do first? So the question is, for large scale projects, how do you, what's the process for accessibility? How do you break it down? How long do you have, sir? <laughs> Maybe we could do a really quick summary. Yeah, quick summary, it would go down back again to baking it in. So you just wanna make sure that 
in the beginning of the project, you're having the right conversations. This means with the client and the project team so that you're all on the same page. And then as you move through the actual project, like you start with um, the UX designer is doing workshops. So they are asking questions already to the client, to the audiences in their research that are helping you kind of define those edges. Um, the, okay. If I could interrupt, yeah. the, the checklists that are in here that we provided, that's what we're doing um, or trying to do on every project. Um, that's a really good place to start. We might have to chat with you after because I think it's oh. a long answer. Yes. Did you have something else to Oh, share? no. I was, I was going to talk to you about that all day because <laughs> I like talking about it, um, but happy to talk to you about after. Yeah. Any other questions? We'll be down here and happy to chat. Come on down. We have cards. Bring your cards and we'll share the deck. Thank you.